Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Impact Books. Today we are talking about none other than Disney by Neil Gabler. This book has totally captured my imagination. It is very long, however, so I've had to break this up into two parts uh, to try and do this book justice in one part, I think would just be a total waste of time. And in all honesty, I haven't finished the book, uh, so I can only truthfully go into the first half. All right, so here we go. Without further ado, the thing that I find utterly captivating. And anybody out there that is an entrepreneur, this book is an absolute must read. And the reason is to see a tale where a guy goes from small town kid, nobody knows who you are, you're living in nowhere, middle America, to becoming one of the most famous and well-recognized people, truly having a massive impact on all of certainly American culture, and I think that his reach was far wider than that, to see it happen, to watch him go from um, dreaming small, quite frankly, to then dreaming a little bit bigger, to not knowing anything about business, to being very good at business, to having huge dreams and really executing at the absolute highest level and to a built-in empire that has lasted long, decades and decades and decades past his death is just absolutely incredible. And I think for all of you, you're gonna see a lot of yourselves in him to see somebody that didn't really start out as the person that anybody would put their finger on and say, this guy is gonna go on to do something. And I know certainly I see myself in that and was just incredibly, incredibly inspired to hear this tale of transformation. And Neil Gabler does an incredible, incredible job of really capturing that emotional journey. I think he does a good job of not, um, painting him as uh, some perfect character. I think he does a really good job of being even-handed and walking you through uh, the journey that he went on. And this really is such a powerful journey. And one of the things that I love about biographies is when they get the scope right, when they don't go into too much detail, because some of them definitely do, but they give you the context of their life and they start early enough that you can really understand the person that they become, that's incredible. And you guys know me, my obsession is going from a fixed mindset to a growth mindset and all of the personality traits and things that go along with that. And you see that journey in spades with Walt Disney. All right, so the most important thing I think to really understand is how big of a gap this story traverses. And um, Walt, his family was a little unsettled in the early years in his life and they moved around and um, his father and his uncle really were always looking for a way to make their fortunes. They weren't the typical person that just got a normal nine to five job and you know worked until retirement. That, that wasn't them. And there was just enough entrepreneurial spirit, just enough sort of crazy, wild-eyed, um, not gambler in the traditional sense, but gambling on winning big in, you know, going off to find your fortunes in the gold rush, or I don't, I don't think they actually did the gold rush, but it was stuff like that. It was like the, the huge opportunities, the big moonshot swings of their day, but always done with a, a little bit of carelessness. So they would routinely lose their fortunes and they would move around a little bit. And there was really one uh, period in Walt's life where they settled in a small town and it becomes really the foundation of a lot of his aesthetic. And when you think about the original Main Street USA in Disneyland, that you can see him trying to really create this universe that harkens back to what he would say were the most beautiful times in his life. And, and having a driving ethos is something that I think is really important. And if you guys understand my obsession and the whole reason that I'm reading about Disney is... I'm literally with impact theory asking myself the question, what would Disney look like if it were founded today? And I believe even before I picked up the book that one of the things that really made Disney so special was there was an ethos behind the scenes that was driving everything. And he had a vision of what the world should be, the way that people should act, and he just adhered to that and tried to create this universe both um, in the stories that he was telling, in the way that his characters were, and then on through the theme parks and what the brand Disney stood for and why it was always family friendly. Um, these were all things that were important to this vision that he had in his head. And those are important things. 
to have ethos if you're trying to build a brand, to have a vision in your head and be able to execute. And that was one of the things that I found really fascinating about the early life of Disney is how he cultivated it in himself uh, what they referred to in the book as a constitutional unflappability, meaning that just his very disposition seemed to make him impervious to things going wrong. And one of the most important things that I think anybody can take out of this tale and one of the most important things that I think anybody should be building in themselves is how do you react to failure? How does it impact your enthusiasm? And that may be one of the most important things to note. Any great leader worth their salt, one of the things that they're able to do is, and there's a great quote, I forget who it's by, forgive me, but the... Um, that real success is going from failure to failure to failure without a loss of enthusiasm. And Walt Disney had that in spades. And when you read the book knowing how it ends up, you know that he ends up building this legendary company, that he has this massive impact on culture, that he builds just an absolutely gigantic juggernaut of a business, literally coming out of the depression. I mean, it's the, the timing of it is incredible. Um, understanding that that's where he ends up and then looking back at the the things that he cultivated in himself, like this unflappability, you begin to realize how powerful it is. And so that was one of the, the real key takeaways from the first half of the book, is having in yourself the emotional fortitude to face relentless and at times seemingly um, divinely placed difficulties. I mean, there are times it literally seems like the world is coming after this guy, like it is intentionally trying to break him. And it is the fact that he pushes through that, that allows him to become Disney. And he does that by cultivating this unflappability, by having this incredibly sharp vision, knowing what he's trying to accomplish and being hell bent to do it. Now, this is fascinating. I'm gonna put my phone down because I really want to get into this motherfucker. Let me tell you right now, the thing that just stopped me dead in my tracks and gave me the absolute chills when things were going wrong, and if you remember nothing else from this book review, remember this. When things were going wrong for Disney, he returned to one thing over and over and over, and that was making the product extraordinary. And Walt really became known for his obsession with making his animations, which by the way, people told him were a total joke. Why are you doing this? It's such a small market. It's never gonna be anything. It's totally childish. Its moment has passed. But he really believed that he could make it better than it had ever been done. And he didn't wanna be the greatest animator. He wanted to be the king of animation. Really stop and think about that for a second. He didn't wanna be the greatest animator. He wanted to be the king of animation. To me, that is the choice you're gonna to have to make in your life. Do you wanna be the best at a position or do you want to define the art form itself? And it doesn't have to be art. Whatever your business is, being a parent, uh, building a local theater, um, building a business, solving a problem, being the greatest marketer in your company, whatever the thing is you're trying to do, what scale are you playing on? And for Disney, in the end, because he did not start there, but in the end, when things were going difficult, when he was being assailed, when people were um, trapping him with bad contracts, when nobody would buy his animation, when people rejected him, when they told him that his cartoon was terrible, whatever, every time that he hit some setback, and guys, this guy had insane amounts of setbacks, um, going bankrupt, uh, having his car repossessed, being evicted. And these things happened to him multiple times. But every time, he returned to making his product so good it couldn't be ignored. Making his product so good that it defined the industry. Making his product so good that it captured the imagination of a generation. And that was his obsession. That's what he would go back to every time, every time. He would come back to, but if we make the product good enough, if it literally startles people with its quality, if other people doing the same thing turn to us as the gold standard, we will win. And he just kept betting on himself and betting on himself 
and betting on himself. And despite making countless mistakes, including pissing off his staff so much that they betrayed him, um, that he let business harden him too much, and that he goes from being sort of this doe-eyed youth to being just this hard-as-nails guy that was pissing everybody off, and then he had to retrograde when his staff betrayed him, and he had to find a way to not let that happen again, but still hold everyone to a standard of excellence, sometimes making them reanimate things like nine times. It's not a made-up number. That was a number in the book. He would make them reanimate something nine times. And even though he pressed people and pushed them and drove them hard, people wanted to follow him because he had a crystal clear vision of what he was trying to create and he just wanted it to be great. And one of his longtime animators said, once you understand Walt doesn't care about making money. That's not what he's doing. Once you understand he does not care about making money, he wants to make something that he's proud of and he wants to have fun doing it. I just got the chills. Once you understand that about him, then you'll understand Walt. You'll understand why he's been able to do what no one else has been able to do because he was always coming back to the product to make it better, to push his own skills, to recognize he's not yet good enough, to recognize that not only he, but the rest of his staff have to get better. That's what made him great. It's not about the flash. And this is one of those things that I'm, I am so terrified because people can only see the content that we publish. They can't see the hustle behind the scenes. But when you look at any great company, and Disney is the perfect example of this, when you look at that, the thing that drove them is an obsession with quality. It's an obsession with doing something great. It's an obsession with giving birth to something that nobody else could do because they're not willing to push themselves. They're not willing to make the demands of themselves to create something of that standard. They're not willing to scrap something and start over. They're not willing to look inward and say, I'm not yet good enough. I can't produce it. I'm not capable. But I can become capable. And that's what Walt had. That's what made him great. That's why ultimately they were able to craft something that would endure. And one other thing, Walt understood he was good at some things and not good at others. And so he partnered with his brother and his brother understood Walt's the visionary. Walt is the guy that's pushing the animation forward. And my job is to take care of the operations. My job is to create that space for him. And that dynamic that dynamic has been repeated so many times in, in film, certainly, but in business in general. And literally, I'm thinking of my wife and how we have to divide roles and we don't try to do the same things. We split the universe and we do what we're good at and we find ways to tap into what we love. And doing that, Finding somebody that complements your skill set, finding somebody that doesn't want to fight you for what you're doing, but they want to do something else that they want to contribute in a massive and meaningful way, that's how you begin to scale this. And I don't think Roy Disney's contributions could ever be overestimated. What he was able to do to facilitate Walt is, is critical and comes across very clearly in the book and was one of the things that I found so compelling is to see the dynamic, to see how important it is to really have the fundamentals of business, to be able to get the loans and the capital that you need to stay afloat, to negotiate contracts. And at the same time, you need somebody that can rally people around an idea that's pushing themselves and other people to get better, that has just an unyielding sense of what the art form can become. And they're willing to put in the work for themselves and those around them to get better, that recognizes when they've pushed people too hard and that ultimately the betrayal was on them and that they have to figure that out and that they have to adapt and get better. All right, I will leave you with that. That is part one. I have but skimmed the surface, but this book is compelling in a way that very few books are. It is an extraordinary biography of a person who started small, dreaming small, believing that they were only capable of something small, and every day believing a little bit more. And every day, even though the world is telling them that they can't do it, that it doesn't make sense, that it's beyond them, has this blinding belief in themselves, the arrogance of belief to know in their gut that they could figure it out. 
that given enough time, they were going to win, that given enough focus relentlessly on making the product great, that they could accomplish something that had never been done before. And my friends, if you put that at the heart of your existence, you will be able to have the same kind of victory. But you've got to cultivate that belief. You've got to get that constitutional unflappability that is so well documented in this book. I'm telling you, pick this one up, dive in. It is long. It is worth every single minute that you will spend on it. I give it absolutely my highest recommendation. All right. This is weekly content, my friends. So if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe and be sure to be picking up these books. And until next time, my friends, be legendary. Take care.